Hey, Streetwalkers. This is a real quick message from our friends at Gone Cold Podcast and Authram Inc., a DNA laboratory. And both Gone Cold Podcast and Authram Inc. are dedicated to giving names to the nameless and solving unsolved crimes. Before we get into this episode, we'd like to tell you how you can help solve cold cases and help identify Jane and John Doe's at dnasolves.com. In November of 2001, in Johnson County, Texas, a resident was picking up cans on the side of Briar Oaks Road. He was shocked when he came upon a jacket that wrapped around the decomposing remains of a newborn baby. The Johnson County Sheriff's Office was dispatched to the scene, and it was determined that the infant had died as the result of foul play. Though tips and leads have surfaced since the discovery, none have panned out, and the identity of the newborn remains a mystery. The infant was named Angel Baby Doe. Just this year, 2021, Johnson County authorities teamed up with Othram Incorporated in hopes to identify the child. Othram specializes in the recovery, enrichment, and analysis of human DNA from trace quantities of degraded or contaminated forensic evidence. If anyone can find out who Angel Baby Doe is, Othram can, but the work on the case needs funding. That's where you can help. At Othram's website, dnasolves.com, you'll find a crowdfunding campaign for Angel Baby Doe and several others that need the public's help. These are cases that the law enforcement agency handling them do not have the funds to perform testing. If you'd like to be a part of that, please go to dnasolves.com and choose a case to help, or help them all if you want. Also, you can upload your DNA data from a consumer testing company, think Ancestry.com or 23andMe.com, to dnasolves.com's database. Your data there is used only in law enforcement investigations. Thanks in advance for the help, y'all. Now, on to the episode. You heard him, Streetwalkers. Go to the website, see what you can donate, even if it's five bucks, and if the case they just mentioned is already funded, throw your money towards another unsolved and unfunded very important case. Thanks, Streetwalkers. Now let's get to it. Hi, uh, this is Richard Kinky Friedman, and uh, you are listening to the podcast Fascination Street. I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with country music sensation Janelle Arthur. You may have seen Janelle in Season 12 of American Idol. And you may have seen her as the lead actress in the film Running From My Roots. But in this episode, we get to know Janelle. We talk about where she grew up, what got her into music, how she was an employee at Dollywood when she was seven years old. Of course, we talk about her time on American Idol. Also, she tells us fun stories about singing at the Grand Ole Opry, which was a lifelong dream for her. We talk a lot about her family-friendly movie, Running From My Roots, and she lets me play the title track from that film. And then we end the show talking about her relationship with Dolly Parton. And I say relationship because they sort of got back together after years of being apart. They worked a little bit together when Janelle was a, a small child and worked at Dollywood. And Dolly has sort of kept in touch in the years since then, which is really sweet. So much so that Janelle's new song, Hand Me Downs, is a duet with Dolly Parton. And she lets me play that too. You can tell by listening that Janelle is a sweet, honest, and genuine person. I highly recommend that if you aren't a fan already, you become one. She has great music, a charming zest for life, and the sky's the limit with this young lady. If you don't already know the name Janelle Arthur, which you may, but if you don't, you will. This 
is my conversation with the lovely and talented Janelle Arthur. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Janelle Arthur. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I cannot complain. So, Streetwalkers, you are going to be amazed at some of the stuff she has done. Considering how young she is, you're really going to be blown away. So, Janelle, let's just start off with where you were born and raised. Where'd you grow up? Well, I was born in uh, Oliver Springs, Tennessee. That is close to Knoxville. Really, that's my hometown, but I even spent more time in probably the Pigeon Forge area. And Pigeon Forge is in Kentucky? Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Oh, it is in Tennessee. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, an hour. It's an hour from my hometown. So, gotcha. Now, some really cool things happened for you in Pigeon Forge, but we'll get back to that later. Yeah. Growing up in Eastern Tennessee, Mm -hmm. uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? I, I know that people don't really have that in their head until they're much later than your career actually started. But was there something that you wanted to be when you grew up, when you were a little girl? You know, I I really think I always, from the time, I guess before I was even talking, I was trying to sing. So I always loved to sing. And I I guess I I always wanted to be a singer. I never imagined, I I started to see people on TV like Vince Gill and Reba McIntyre, and um, I'm sure Dolly and people like that. And I, I kind of, I think I was able to understand from a very early age that there were people that did that. Like, that's what they did. They got up on stage and they sang and that was their job. And I think I really understood that from a very early age. I mean, of course, I probably I I remember one time saying I wanted to be a brain surgeon or something like that. But that was always my side job. I always wanted to be a singer. I don't remember wanting to be really anything else. And I told my mom, probably when I was about four years old, that I wanted to be on the Grand Ole Opry. So I guess I knew from a really early age. That is amazing. How cool would it be if all of that turned out and you actually, you know, you'd go on tour and perform in front of 75,000 people and then the next morning get up and go do brain surgery. (laughs) I know. Isn't that crazy? crazy. I was like, how did I even want to do that? I don't know. (laughs) That's a lot of school. (laughs) Yeah. So growing up in that area, I mean, you just said that music was kind of always around and it was always there. But how important was music in your family? Music in my family, my parents, they weren't musical people necessarily, but they were always playing music around the house, like um, on the TV or on the radio. And um, that's actually how my mom discovered that I loved music so much was the way that I reacted to it. So My family, as far as my parents go, they weren't necessarily musical, but my aunt and uncle, they were musical. My grandmother was somewhat musical. My uncle can play guitar and my aunt plays the drums. And so um, they had a band for a little while and I would sing sometimes in the venues where they were playing. And we really got together probably every family occasion and would sing on the porch or sing in the living room and sing a lot of three-part harmony. So music has always really been in my family, really, when I think about it. It sounds like. You you mentioned that you weren't far from Pigeon Forge growing up. Mm -hmm. Something really cool happened there. Your mom, I don't know, wrote a letter or made a phone call or something. Tell that story. What's up? When I was about seven years old, I had auditioned for this show kids choir, and I didn't make it. I hoped I would. And my Southern accent was too thick to be in a choir full of Broadway. I'm sorry. Did you, you think you have an accent? (laughs) Not at all. So I I thought, you know, uh, looking back, I'm like, wow, there was no way I was making it into that choir because I was just so, you know, Southern, so country. And so I just thought that's funny that I even thought that was a possibility. But I didn't make it and I was sad. And my mom saw an ad in the Country Weekly and she called Dollywood up and she knew I was so sad. She thought, well, I, you know, I want to see if maybe this could be an opportunity for her. And she asked them if they were still needing any little kids in their show. And they said, yeah, we're still looking for one little girl to portray a young Dolly Parton. And so my mom said, well, can my daughter come and audition? And they said, yeah. Next thing I know, I'm getting the job, and I was there for three years portraying a young Dolly Parton in the show about her life story called Paradise Road. That's dope. Yeah. 
I'm going to venture to say that that accent probably helped you get that job because even to this day, Dolly has one of the most recognizable Southern country accents that's ever been. So I'm assuming that you didn't have to try and get rid of that accent for that role. I didn't. (laughs) I didn't have to change a single thing about myself. That was the really neat thing. I just was myself and happened to be very believable as a young Dolly. Was that an acting or a singing show or was it both? It was somewhat both. Um, I did have a few lines, but it was mostly just music. Very few lines, mainly saying songs that she wrote when she was like four years old. She wrote a song about her little doll. It was made out of corn shuck. She wrote about that doll named Little Tiny Tassel Top. And I sang that sh- that song. And then I sang Puppy Love and the Kaz Walker theme song, songs that she sang when she was on the Kaz Walker show when she was, you know, probably a preteen and a teenager. She was doing that show. And that was really where she got her start was on the Kaz Walker show. Wow. That's really neat. Okay. So my timing may be off a little bit, but you auditioned for, I think it was season 10, 11, and 12 of yes. the, the TV show American Idol. So yes. I'm assuming since you auditioned for three seasons, I'm assuming you didn't get picked for the first two. I did not. I made it really far both seasons. The first year I made it to group round and then I made it to top 60. The second year I made it to like the Vegas round. So top 60 was as far as I made it. And then I ended up going back just for the heck of it one more time and made it to the top five. Now I have a question. One of the things that I like to talk about on my show is why people thought they could do something. Okay. So <laughs> you, you got disappointed be- when you were a, a little tiny kid because you felt like your accent was too strong for you to make it as a singer. And then that turned out not to be true because it helped you get that gig at Dollywood. And then you didn't get picked twice for uh, American Isle, but yet you, you had the wherewithal to go back and try it again. Why? Why didn't you just give up? Um, because I, I think that just being in the industry, you know, first off, I wouldn't have even been able to get the Dollywood gig without my mom taking that, you know, step to call them and reach out. But with American Idol, I actually got rejected three times from American Idol. I, for, I went my first time and went to, to the arena and got turned down at the tables you go sing in front of producers at these tables in the middle of a, of an arena. And I went back two weeks later and went to Austin, Texas and made it all the way to Hollywood week. So, I mean, I really auditioned four times in three seasons. And I think the first time what kept me going back was the fact that I knew I was in front of two producers and I know that that was just their opinion. They said I wasn't what they were looking for, but I strongly felt like, well, that's just their opinion. And if I can get with in front of some other producers, maybe they will think I'm, you know, right for their TV show. So that's what kept me going back then. And then I kept going back year after year, mainly because I understood, even though I was really young, I understood it was a TV show and I realized they were casting. I realized that a lot of times it's just what they're looking for. It's not about like talent is kind of like an expected thing and you should be talented if you're auditioning for a show like that. And then the people who make it, who make the cut are always the people that they feel like are relatable or the people that will fill that spot for that personality type or kind of, like I said, like a character in a sense. So you got to get there when when they're looking for a blonde country girl <laughs> for me. That's funny. Yeah. Well, I think it's really impressive that even at a young age, you were able to figure out, you know what? They're not rejecting me as a person or me and my talents. It's not that I'm good enough. I just might not be what they're looking for right now. Right. Um, that's really, really ahead of your age. How old were you when when you auditioned the first time? 20 years old. I just turned 20. Wow. That's really, really forward thinking. Well done. (laughs) Um, So what, what songs were you singing when you were doing these auditions? Oh my goodness. I did anything from the letter by the box tops to no one needs to know by Shania Twain. Um, At one point I sang heartache tonight by the Eagles. I was just singing all kinds of stuff. 
because I felt like I needed to show versatility. And here's a tip for anybody who's auditioning for a show that you feel like you need to show versatility. I feel like I made it the third season because I just stayed in the country genre. I didn't go, oh, well, they're going to do a rock week. So I need to show them I can do a rock song. That was kind of my thinking. And um, I think they just want to know that stereotype that you kind of are. And I kind of, I feel like understood that and just said, well, I'm just going to do what I do. And that's country music. So I'm just going to keep doing that. And I think it worked for me. I think that's real smart and great advice. My wife and I watch a lot of cooking competition shows. And Mm -hmm. particularly there's a show on the Food Network called like the next Food Network star or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they talk about on that show when they're going through and, you know, talking to contestants and trying to pick one and things is to have your own they call it a point of view, but really, basically, it just says what you said, which is kind of, you're going to have to pick a lane because if you do win or you are selected, we are going to have to know how to promote you and market you. Yeah. yeah, And we can't, Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to pick a lane and kind of stay there. And then later on, they can sort of tweak you or whatever they need to do. So I think that's great advice, you know, pick a lane and and stay there at least until they tell you to move out of that exactly. lane. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's until they say, Hey, there's a theme tonight and this is what you need to do, you know? Okay. So you made it to the top five, five. Yes. So you didn't win, but it's not over then, right? No. I mean, I think it's a blessing sometimes to not make it as far. Um, I mean, we've seen from examples in the past, so many people that have gone on to do, to have great careers made it, you know, Jennifer Hudson made it. She was cut in the top eight. I think she was top eight. Kelly Pickler was like top six, I think, six or four. I can't remember. And, you know, Chris Daughtry, he was, he came in third. So, I mean, we have a lot of different people that had great careers, even though they didn't win. And honestly, once you get to the top three, you're stuck in a very, very restricting contract. And so I felt like I got really the best of both worlds because I made it far enough to get the exposure, made it far enough to go on the American Idol tour. I made it far enough to where I got to just have this experience and, you know, it was a part of the only all female top five in American Idol history. So I made it far enough to be a part of that. And then I made it far enough to perform with the band Perry on the finale. But then yet I still wasn't stuck in those, you know, really restricting contracts. And so that was honestly, at the end of the day, it was, it was a blessing. I'm pretty sure Clay Aiken came in second also yes. to like yes. a Ruben Stoddard, I think. So yes. I, I agree with what you're saying about, you know, just because you win doesn't mean you don't win. <laughs> That's right. I mean, American Idol, honestly, people will ask me, you know, was the show good? Are you glad you did the show? I mean, to be honest, the show has been what has opened doors for me to this day. It's it's really about the team that you have around you after you're on the show that makes or breaks you. And who picks that team? It depends. Sometimes you're stuck. Like I was saying with top three, you could be told, you know, this is your team. And for me, I had a few things that were just set up for me where I was kind of stuck in this and that can kind of be a hairy situation, you know, but honestly, the show itself, American Idol just really did so many things for my career. I don't know if I ever would have played the Grand Ole Opry if I hadn't, you know, had that exposure. So how did that Grand Ole Opry performance come along? Well, it's interesting. I was at my friend's Grand Ole Opry debut and the general manager at the time, Pete Fisher, he came up to me and he he saw me just standing backstage and he approached me and he said, hey, he said, I saw you on the American Idol tour. He said, and I watched you on the show. And he said, I'm really glad you're here right now because I wanted to ask, I would like to invite you to play the Grand Ole Opry. And I just didn't see that coming at all because I was just there supporting my friend. And um, But apparently he had been wanting to invite me. So I'm just so thankful that I got to do something like that. And there for about two years, I was playing about once a month. So Really? At the Grand Ole Opry? Yes. (laughs) How cool is that? Yeah, it was amazing. Such an honor. What was the first song you sang at the Grand Ole Opry? 
I'm so lonesome I could cry by Hank Williams. You are not the first person that I've had on the show that sang that song. <laughs> Back in the, I think it was, it was either the late sixties or early seventies. A man named B.J. Thomas, who became yeah, huge, wildly famous. Oh, yeah, I've met B.J. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's great. That was his first hit. He uh, yeah. he did that song. I'm so lonesome I could cry. Yeah, that was his first hit. Such a nice guy, by the way. Yes. Holy moly! What what occasion did you have to meet him? We were doing like a choir setup. They wanted to do like this. Um, at the Opry? No, it wasn't at the Opry. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was some sort of recording studio. It was Linda Davis and a few other people that I recognized and um, some different musicians and artists in Nashville. And I'm pretty sure we were doing, it was something for charity and it's left my brain because it's been a while back, but he had written the song that we were singing. He and this other woman. Yeah, it was really good. It was really fun, but I got to meet him briefly. Yeah. Oh, very cool. He was very nice. nice. Yeah. He was super nice when I talked to him too. Now, why didn't you sing during any of your auditions or or part of the show, why didn't you sing any Dolly songs? I mean, you've been singing them since you were seven. I did sing Dumb Blonde on American Idol. My last, it was my last performance on the show. Oh. But I did try to do White Limousine during one of the Vegas rounds, and they discouraged me from doing that. Really? Yeah. And then I did A Kiss Goodnight by um, Lady Antebellum, and then Randy said I should have done a Dolly song. <laughs> <laughs> so, so did you, you laugh? Know. Were you just like, come on? <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I'm not even going there. I could have been like, well, I was going to do White Limousine. I thought I'm just going to roll with it and just smile pretty for the camera. So, yeah, I was wanting to sing White Limousine, but I, it was kind of discouraged. And so I just kind of thought, well, I'll just do. Yeah, I love A Kiss Good Night by Le- Lady Antebellum. So I just did that one. And I was happy with that song choice, honestly. Well, uh, Randy could, well, at least he didn't say it was a little pitchy dog. Oh, I know. He didn't say that. Thank the Lord. (laughs) Oh, by the way, I'm sure you know this already, but you share a birthday with the great Frank Sinatra. Yes, I did know that. I have kind of forgotten that, but yeah, I did know that. That's so around awesome. here. We celebrate that birthday, like at my house. Oh, my my son, all right. My son is December tenth. My daughter's December fourteenth, and then my boy Frank is right there in the middle on the twelfth. Wow! Oh, so, I love it. I love yeah, we have, it. We have a big party week over here. That's awesome. Hey, streetwalkers! Here's a word from our sponsors. Magic 8 Ball. Should people visit disabilityshirts.com? Yes, I am sure. This is Sammy Haney. I play Esperanza on Netflix's Raising Dion, and you're listening to the Fascination Street Podcast. If you're looking for some shirts with inclusive messages, check out my store, disabilityshirts.com. Let's get back into it. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, somebody reached out and said, hey, I want you to be in a movie. What is (laughs) happening in your life over there? Your phone's just ringing off the hook with these opportunities. Tell how that happened. Well, it was interesting. I was about to sign my first publishing deal because I am a songwriter and I actually moved to Nashville solely based off of the fact that I wanted to be a songwriter. And the artist thing is just a part of what I do, but I, I love to write songs as well. So I was honestly about to sign this publishing deal and I got this call and I still signed my publishing deal, but I'm just saying I was very, very much focused on songwriting and getting this publishing deal. And I get a call from a casting director, Gabrielle Evans Fields. And she knew that she saw, she saw me on American Idol. And this was a few years later. I mean, this was, this was not right after the show. So how does that work? It's like they re air American Idol, do they? No, they don't. They don't. But I mean, she remembered me from years ago. And whenever this script came up, Um, She did remember me. And a lot of it, I think, is because um, we had some mutual friends. And I I think my friends had posted stuff about me over the years. And it just kind of probably kept me like fresh in her memory, in her mind. And 
So she got in touch with me through our ter- our friend, Terry Minton, who is an awesome actress and just amazing person. And uh, Terry gave her my info and she called me up. And next thing I know, I'm playing the lead role in this movie. And Dina Carter that sang the song Strawberry Wine, she's playing my mother. And Neil McCoy that I grew up listening to as well and had seen in concert. He had a scene with me kind of towards the beginning of the movie. And it was just an overall bucket list thing for me to check off. You know, I just knew that I'd always wanted to do something like that. So I couldn't turn it down as long as the script was, you know, it had stuff in it that I felt comfortable with. So I had to, of course, read over the script and make sure that I felt comfortable with everything that was in there. So having not much of an acting background, I know you did some plays in school and things like that, but having not much of an acting background, How hard was it to step into the lead actor's role in this film? Was there a bunch of weight on your shoulder? I mean, you're carrying this film essentially as the star. I carried the weight of the entire film and I felt it too, you know, because I didn't want these other actors and actresses who had spent years trying to be in a movie and then they get in this movie and I'm the lead role and I didn't have much acting experience. And then they're like, wow, who's this girl coming in here? And so I I definitely felt the pressure and I wouldn't watch any playback because I didn't want to know if there was something I was doing that I couldn't control about myself or fix about myself. So I really, until I saw the movie, I didn't know what my performance looked like at all. I actually was a lot more pleased with my performance than I thought I would be. I thought I would, I thought it would be terrible and I thought I'd probably want to go throw up, but I didn't. So (laughs) I was very happy with the overall experience and I'd love to do it again. I'd I'd love to do some more acting and Um, I love the fact that I got to sing in it. Dina and I wrote a song that we sing in the movie together. Is that the title track? Is that song the name of the movie? The movie title was supposed to be Take Two for Faith. And then I ended up singing one of my original songs at the end called Running From My Roots because it was the exact storyline of the script. And I had written it way before I got the call. Oh, really? So you didn't write it for the movie? Did not write it for the movie. And my character, I'm reading the script and my character says something about, you know, how she was in love with daisies and how their roots, you know, grow strong and deep and just talking about their roots. And I was just like, roots, I have a song called Running From My Roots. And then I'd start thinking about the meaning behind the song and the meaning about uh, behind this movie. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is too perfect. I've got to play this for our director, Nancy Chris. And so I did. And. She was like, this has got to go in the movie. So we made it happen. And then they changed the name of the movie to Running From My Roots. How cool is that? How how did that feel? Like when they were like, <laughs> you know what, we're going to do, we're going to change the name to the name of your song. How'd that feel? <laughs> Felt really good. I mean, honestly, I was a little confused because I was just like, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> like, it's just my song. So I, I was honored that they wanted to do that. And they felt like it'd be the right name. That's really cool. Now, feel free to say no, but would it be okay if I played that song? Oh, of course. Absolutely. Do you want to introduce it like you're a radio DJ? Sure. Hey, y'all. I'm Janelle Arthur, and this is Running From My Roots. Got my keys loaded down Mazda. Hugged my daddy. Kissed my mama. Crazy weekends, all nighters trying to fit in. I 
Thanks. I appreciate that. Right. I love playing music on my show. I absolutely love it. Now, I know that that movie came out a couple of years ago, right? Yes. And it came out everywhere, but then it was exclusively physical copies were available at Walmart, right? Yes. How? Why? Huh? Do you have any idea how that happened or why that happened? No, cool. I don't. Know. All right. Um, me either. I mean, I know that, I mean, you know, Big places do stuff like that. Like I think Taylor Swift had a Target only album a bunch of years ago or something. Yeah, so. I mean, for but it was weird because it was supposed to be exclusively at Walmart, and eventually people were saying they were seeing it in different stores. So oh, wow, I can't explain it. I can't. Maybe it was a limited ex- exclusivity. Yeah, it might have been just for like the first few weeks or something. But people saw them at Dollar General as well, like right on the counter. People would be just paying for their stuff and. They would see my movie just sitting there on display. So how many yeah, copies I mean, of your movie do you have in your house right now? Probably one. Oh, that's crazy. Probably only one. I, w- I wish we bought a few more just, you know, because there have been some people because I don't really watch a lot of DVDs. So but there have been some people that we've needed to send a DVD to. So I needed to get probably a few more. <laughs> yeah, I mean. At some point when COVID is over, you're going to be touring again, right? And I, I feel so. like that could be part of your merch that you're selling. It, it could be. Yeah, it really could be. But I didn't I didn't buy a ton like I probably should have. <laughs> That's funny. Well, whenever you start touring again and, and get all big at stuff, you can reach oh. out to whoever those people are and say, hey, I need some copies to sell on the road. Yes, uh, exactly. because they'll make money because you're going to pay for them and then you'll make money when you sell them. So that's I, right. That's I right. I think you absolutely need to do that. Well, now, man. you have is it a new album or is it a single? It's a single. I have a new single. Now, once again, you're reunited with your seven year old counterpart. <laughs> how did this, uh, why, how, wh- how did Dolly get involved in this particular? Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the great Dolly Parton. This is a duet called Hand Me Downs, and it's you and Dolly. How did she come to be a part of that project? Dolly and I, of course, we met many years ago when I did the show Paradise Road. But then we we kind of lost touch. You know, I wasn't around her for many years and uh, because I was 
doing my own thing. I was performing in different theaters and um, she, doing she was probably things. busy too. I'm just, Oh, saying. Oh yeah. She was busy, but <laughs> I had no reason to be around her because she only came to Dollywood and I wasn't at Dollywood anymore. A lot of people, when they work at Dollywood, they run into Dolly, you know, randomly because she's always there. Well, I wasn't Do- at Dollywood anymore. I was on the strip of Pigeon Forge. So you're telling me that just regular park goers, like just some fool who pays their admission price to get in, could actually accidentally run into Dolly Parton? I was meaning entertainers. Em- employees and things? Yes, employees. Okay, I- all right, yes, cool. Yes. She shows up randomly and will do like a pop-up kind of performance or, you know, just all kinds of stuff or appearance. So I didn't get to just run into Dolly anymore because I was doing my own thing and I wasn't around. But then I moved to Nashville, did American Idol, and she actually reached out to me when I was on the show. Really? Yes. They, I think it was American Idol, you know, reached out to her and she wanted to send a letter of of support to me. So she sent a letter. They read it live on TV. And did they give you the letter? They did. And yeah. you still have it? And it's framed. I, and things? You know what? It, you she didn't worst. write it. It was all typed out, but okay. it's somewhere. It's somewhere. But the, I have other letters from Dolly that I have kept. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So she wrote that letter to me and it kind of made me, or a little note, I should say. And it made me feel like, wow, she still knows who I am and she still, you know, believes in me. So that was kind of a good little confidence boost. But later on, I get back to Nashville, you know, after the tour and everything. This was probably a year later. And I'm writing with a girl named Emily Lynch. And we write our very first song together in this very house where I am right now. And we write this song called Hand Me Downs. And I'm not, we're not thinking anything about Dolly when we wrote this. Um, We both love the song. She even recorded a version of it herself. And then it just hits me. You know, I don't, when I say this, I don't compare song to song. I only compare feeling to feeling. So it was like the feeling that you get when you listen to a song like Coat of Many Colors, where you're just like, wow, I'm just, you know, you're just proud of your family and and your heritage and you don't care. Like you see the beauty in it when other people may not even see the beauty in it. You see it and you have pride. And that's just kind of like what I felt. And then I was like, dang, this is almost like a modern day Dolly Parton song. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to get this song to Dolly. And I thought, well, how in the heck am I going to do that? You know, it's she's Dolly Parton. She's untouchable. And I remembered that someone that I had performed with many, many years ago in that show about Dolly's life called Paradise Road, my friend Steve Summers, he now works for Dolly Parton Enterprises. Well done, Steve. Yes, yes. And he is just, he's amazing. He's so talented and he's so creative and he's the creative director for Dolly Parton Enterprises. And he was always just really creative, even at Dollywood. You know, he did a lot of things there. He was amazing. And I just always loved him and was really close with his daughters as well. And then next thing I know, I asked him just, hey, do you think she'd be interested in listening to this song? And I sent it to him and he ended up playing it for her. And Next thing I know, he's saying, call me. And then he says, she wants you to just tell her what you want her to do. So so did he text you or did he email you? He's like, hey, call me. And you're like, what? Yeah, yeah. He just messaged me and I called him and I was just like, okay. <laughs> I, I was just blown away. I was blown away at the fact that, number one, that she even took the time to listen to the song. And, and then the fact that, you know, Dolly is so... Dolly is Dolly because, you know, she's it's, she's really good at turning things down in the nicest way possible, <laughs> you know, right. just like she did with Jake Owen recently. She she wrote him a letter and said, you know, she couldn't sing on his song or whatever. And but yet she's just still so lovable and amazing. And, you know, she's a businesswoman and she's not going to put her name on something and her voice and her brand on something that she doesn't believe in. So the fact that she believed in my song and me and all of this enough, to, you know, just to be a part of it was unreal. It was unreal and so humbling. I think that we can tell a lot about a person by the way that they say no, right? If you could tell somebody no and they're not mad at you for saying it, like they're not even angry, like she could have told you no in her sweet way or whatever. And it's not like you're going to yes. you know, be anti-Dolly. I mean, exactly. But that's just not how she rolls. She's just the sweetest and 
There's she plenty is. of reasons to not do something. And I think that part of what makes her such a, a legend and a long lasting performer is her ability to navigate the yeses and the no's and the feelings and the hurt feelings. I think that's really dope. Yes. I think it's amazing. Yeah. She's just an angel. And everybody, everybody loves her. If you don't love her, then there's something wrong with you, probably. <laughs> right. It says more about you than it does about her. It does. That's for sure. It does. Yeah. So my name is Steve Owens. And mm-hmm. Dolly's mother's maiden name is Owens. Yes. And according to my father, my people are from Tennessee. So oh. I'm willing to bet that we're related. You probably but, are. But I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure yeah, she wouldn't she know a, either if I asked her. So <laughs> yeah, she had a grandpa named Jake Owens and he was a preacher. And that's what's really It's crazy to me because whenever we wrote this song, the second verse talks about how grandpa and it talks about grandpa's Bible. And, you know, it's funny that that's her verse that she sings and she had a grandpa that was a preacher. And, you know, we didn't try to make that happen. It just was the way that it was and just really perfect how it all came together. Um, I couldn't have asked for just a a more perfect situation. And then this song was supposed to come out last year. Um, and then COVID, you know, took over and we were in the middle of a pandemic and we just thought, you know, there are a lot more important things going on than my new song. And so I just thought, well, I'll just release, you know, just some music here and there and we'll save hand-me-downs for a, a later time. And it couldn't have really been a more perfect time, I think, than right now. So it was recorded a while ago? It was, Before yes. the pandemic? It was. It's supposed to come out in 2020. Oh, wow. So Mm -hmm. when you recorded it, were you in the studio with her recording at the same time or did y'all do it in two different studios? And she likes to do a lot of things remotely. Right. She did mention in a letter that I still have that she hoped that we could get together and be in the studio together and get pictures. And um, but it just never happened. We never got to it never worked out. But that was totally fine with me because. I just was so grateful just that she was a part of it. That was good enough for me. And then I actually got to see her after she had put her vocal on the song. I I saw her and we, you know, got a picture together. So I really did to see her, but I didn't get to be in the studio with her. Mm -hmm. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. It is 2140. You are trapped in an underground bunker. Built a century ago to protect mankind from the pandemic on the surface. Now ruled by tyrants and their robot army. You are an outcast, an orphan, a scavenger, blind, afraid, and alone. You are Ace, a survivor. And you will try to escape this place. This place known as Subterra. Subscribe to Subterra at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you download podcasts. Let's get back into it. So... I'm always curious because, you know, people do duets all the time. And a million years ago, like we talked about Frank, uh, Frank Sinatra, I think it was 1990 something. He did an album called Duets and it was other famous people singing duets with him. But yeah, none of them were ever in the studio together yeah. at all. And so, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> and so that's kind of kind of how you did yours. But I, I'm always curious, like, let's just take your song, for example hand-me-downs so mm-hmm. you sang the whole song and that's how she heard it so when she went in did she sing the whole song and then you picked which verses you were gonna be hers in the final track or how does that work she wanted me like whenever i told you that steve said to call him and and she said tell me what you want me to do um i had to go in and do my own sort of recording of it and i had to write out the lyrics and which parts that i would like for her to sing on okay. and then i did a recording of myself singing the harmony so she could hear exactly what part i was hearing for her as if i cared what she did but that's what she asked me to do was right. lay it out there for her i wouldn't have cared what she sang and when she sang but yeah 
That's how it I, works. I, I do think it's really funny when people who are really, really good at what they do and have been doing it for a long time, they say, well, what do you think? And you're just like, I, you're, <laughs> you're the, you're the person. I don't just do you I know. <laughs> knock I yourself know. out, go sick, whatever you want. <laughs> I know it's funny. So many, but that just shows you her humility and that, right. you know, that she's able to say, you know, your opinion matters. You know, that's, I mean, not many people when they've, they've done all that she's done, or they're going to, they're not going to look at someone else and say, you know, better than I do. What do you, you tell me what I should do on your song? Like, so many people be like, well, I know what to do better than you do. So right. most good. of them will say that. And the ones that don't will, will give their opinion and then say, but what do you think? And not really care, but that's really yeah. Cool. They don't care. They're just doing it to be nice, and she was doing it because she to be really genuine, did it. right? Yes. Yeah. So, what are you going to do with this single? Well, I am trying to just get it out to as many people as I can. That's one reason why I'm, of course, doing this interview with you, hoping to reach people that need a message like this and um, that love Dolly and. Also, we're looking for um, as a nostalgic kind of song to listen to, because I feel like we've all kind of been reminded and everything we went through last year, everybody's just kind of been refocused on what really matters. And um, so I feel like maybe there are some people that really would re would relate to this song right now. And my goal is to really just get it out to as many people as possible. Do you have uh, any plans for a new album or some new music maybe this year or next year i do have um some more music in the can thank the lord i do because i just i, I actually got in the studio a little bit last year just kind of on a whim to do some demos and stuff and thankfully because of that i will have some music to release this year as well oh good yeah so i'm really looking forward to that because i'm really proud of these songs too now are you still a I guess, do you still have a contract to be a songwriter? Do you still have a publishing deal with somebody? I do not. And that it just expired. It wasn't like y'all got mad at each other and gave no, each other the word no, and walked away. No, that the company went under. They they oh, were wow. amazing, they were amazing people. I loved working for them. I loved the people that I wrote with over there, and I hated what happened because you know they they were a great company. Um, it's what happens sometimes when you get investors that don't understand how the music industry works. You know, you kind of you you go full force into the music industry, and you don't realize, hey, a lot of times you're not going to make money back for a very long time, and actually, you may never make your money back. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's true. So what happens with those songs? Do they revert back to you as owner or whoever? Like what happened? Girl, as I have a, no idea. I'd have to, I would have to buy back my catalog. I have, I got, I gave them about 60 songs. So uh, yeah, it'd be great. Maybe one day I'll be able to have those songs back, get those songs yeah. back. Maybe as, as you go, you can just buy them one at a time. It's true. Yeah. I'm sure 60 would be expensive, but one at a time you could probably do. Yeah. Yeah. Was there any songs that you wrote that got recorded and released by anyone else? Yeah. So have you heard of Tennille Arch that has somebody like that? She yeah. just went number one. Yeah. So Tennille, uh, I was very blessed to have done a lot of backgrounds for her, a lot of her EPs and albums that she had done. And then I sang with her on The Bachelor, the, act, the show, The Bachelor, sang on there with her a couple of times. She cut a song that we wrote together called Bridges Burn. She's originally from Canada. And so I've had a lot of or a few of independent artist cuts, you know, she was independent at the time. Now she's with uh 19th and grand. So, you know, I, but I've, I had a, an Australian artist cut one of my songs that we wrote together called stronger than, you know, and then another girl, my friend, Brittany Brody, she's from Canada. She cut a song that we wrote together called death of me. And so, you know, I've had different little cuts here and there that I've been very proud of. But most, I mean, the best part is, they're all really talented people that have cut those songs. So I love hearing the finished product. Nice. That's yeah. super sweet. Now I know I did ask you a huge favor earlier and, <laughs> and you were kind enough to say, yes, I'm going to ask you for another one. Okay. I don't know if you're going to be cool with this, but this song hand me downs is so beautiful. Now I hope that you're going to say yes, but you don't have to. Okay. Can I play that song? Of course. 
I guess so. <laughs> Fun fact, the heartbeat that you hear throughout the song is actually the sound of my mother's heartbeat. Really? Yes. Whose idea was that? Mine. <laughs> well, what gave you that idea? I don't know. I knew. I just, I don't know. I had this, I've always had kind of a production brain um, anyway, and just like with arranging songs and for live performances. And so whenever we got in the st studio, I just was very adamant about, I wanted my mother's heartbeat on the song because it's not only for the lyric purposes, but just because it's just dear to me, special to me. And so to have my hero Dolly and my hero mama on there, pretty cool. <laughs> that is really cool. Just so you know, that's the kind of thing that you keep a secret until Mother's Day. And then you'd be like, oh, hey, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. Hey, that would have been a good strategy right there. Right? You should have talked to me about that a while back. <laughs> so one last time, do you want to uh, do you want to intro this song? Yes. Hey, y'all, I'm Janelle Arthur, and this is my brand new duet with Dolly Parton, Hand Me Downs. You're good at that. Thank you. <laughs> That is awesome. Now, as we're heading out, Janelle, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Yes, I am on, I guess, all the social media networks. I wouldn't suggest, you know, my, my website where it's kind of under construction right now. So Instagram, Twitter, 
Facebook, TikTok, and stuff like that. I'm just, I'm all over the place. So, because just because I have to be. <laughs> and it's at Janelle Arthur everywhere? It's everywhere is kind of varies. Most of, most of the time, it's just Janelle Arthur. Like Instagram is just Janelle Arthur. You'll see the blue check. I'm, I'm verified on Instagram and Facebook. And then um, on Twitter, I'm Janelle O. Arthur. And on TikTok, it's Janelle Arthur one, the number one. What's the O stand for? My middle name. Mm-hmm. Oredith. <laughs> so oh, all right, cool. I get Oredith. it. Oredith. Yeah. Is that a Oredith. family name? Was that grandma's it name or it something? It was my grand it was my grandmother's name. Oredith. O R E D I T H. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um and you said don't go to your website because it's under construction. I mean, you can go there, but you really won't find much. You'll just see a few pictures. And <laughs> if you really want to know what I'm up to, you got to go to Instagram and Facebook and stuff like that. Any plans for a tour? Well, I mean, I would love to go on a tour. I actually went on a little back porch tour last year in the middle of this craziness because we didn't, you know, we couldn't really play inside venues. So we just got people to let us come onto their porch and play. So um, I would be up for doing some more out, outdoor concerts and then just whatever, whatever we can get planned. I've already been booking dates for this year, for sure. Oh, that's fantastic. And so if yeah. anybody wants to find out what those dates are, go yeah. to the previously mentioned social medias. Yes. Awesome. Well, Janelle, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic schedule to hang well, out and let us for get having to know you me. a little bit better. Is there mm-hmm. anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about today? I don't think so. I think we covered everything. Uh, I <laughs> love to hear that. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. You were a very fun and easy conversationalist. I appreciate that. It's Good. not always that easy. Not Good always that easy. For sure. <laughs> All right, Janelle, you have a great rest of your week. And uh, thank you again. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, Hey, Streetwalkers, it's time for a giveaway. Thanks to our generous friends at Sylvania, we're going to give away some Bluetooth speakers. What do you think? These are fairly special and limited Fascination Street podcast edition as they have a little Fascination Street emblem on the end. This oblong Bluetooth speaker is about 8 inches tall and about 3 inches in diameter and is IPX4 waterproof. So how do you win? Well, what I need all of you to do is post a short video to your Instagram story, your Facebook story, or even your TikTok, telling everybody why you love Fascination Street Podcast and which is your favorite episode. Make sure to tag the show in these videos, and each week I'll pick one winner to win one of these special limited edition Sylvania Bluetooth speakers, and I'll mail it to you. And I might even throw a couple of other Fascination Street Pod swag in there as well. So tell a friend, tell all your friends, and include it in your stories on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok. And don't forget to tag the show, Fascination Street Podcast. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2001 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is from the song Say My Name off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems, used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening.